Uh, I welcome you all to this uh, keynote session of uh, the conference. And today, this evening and morning of United States, we are extremely lucky to have a speaker like Professor Evelyn N. Wang. Everybody in the field of phase change heat transfer probably knows her and she know, needs no introduction, but just for the sake of formality, uh, I'd like to go through the introduction of Professor Wang. Professor Wang is the fourth professor engineering and uh, is the fourth uh, professor engineering and department head in the mechanical engineering department at MIT. She received her BS from MIT and MS and PhD from Stanford University in mechanical engineering from 2006, 2007. She was a postdoctoral researcher at Bell Laboratories. Her research interests include fundamental studies of micro nanoscale heat and mass transport and the development of efficient thermal management, solar thermal energy conversion, and water harvesting systems. Her work has been honored with several awards, including the ASME 2012, uh, including the 2012 ASME uh, Bartels Rosenhau Young Investigator Award, the 2016 ASME EPPD Women Engineer Award the 2017 ASME Gustus L. Larson Award, and the 2020 ICNNM Prominent Researcher Award. She is an ASME Fellow. Besides uh, her, uh, uh, she's particularly known for her research on solar power devices to extract drinkable water from the atmosphere. And her technology on uh, extracting water from uh, arid climates uh, has won the top 10 emerging technologies of 2017. Uh, with this introduction, I'd like to request uh, Dr. Wang to illuminate us on this highly exciting field of nanoengineering evaporative device for energy and water applications. The session is yours, Professor Wang. Thank you, Ranjan. I really appreciate the kind introduction and I really appreciate the opportunity to share our work today. Uh, what I'd like to share is just a subset of our work specifically focused on evaporation and how evaporation and engineering materials and uh, structures in a way to help us achieve more efficient evaporative devices and elucidate some of the important physics to be able to make impacts in energy and water applications. So phase change heat transfer is important for various industries. And we know already in the thermal management community that in fact, phase change devices are used in our daily lives, such as in a laptop computer. So what you see here, in fact, is a heat pipe that helps you now more effectively transfer the heat generated from your microprocessor to the fan such that it can be blown out to the ambient. Another example is in that of hot water systems. So for example, here you see a heat pipe by which you take advantage of solar energy to heat up now this heat pipe and to transfer this heat to then a hot water system so you can use for your household. Also, as they think about larger systems such as that in power generation and water desalination, phase change is critical to generate the scale of power and water that we need for our daily lives as well. Now, when we think more specifically, as I already mentioned, thermal management is a significant challenge in an area that we have been, of, that we have int been interested in addressing for quite some time. We know the state of the art often in a desktop or uh, type of computer, in fact, is a fin fan array. And now sometimes they will integrate to enhance efficiency of the spreading by incorporating a heat pipe as what you see here. However, we know that in fact, there are still significant challenges in thinking about what exists in terms of commercial technologies and what is required in terms of the performance of these heat sinks for the operation of our desktop and laptop computers, as well as more high-end servers, et cetera. There are also many applications such as power amplifier designs and diode laser arrays, where all of the power densities, in fact, are reaching over a thousand watts per centimeter squared. So the key challenge in this field is thinking about, well, how do we dissipate these very high fluxes with 
considering that you also need a very low temperature rise. And so this is an important problem that we've been trying to address. In addition to thinking about larger scale systems, such as, for example, a solar thermal steam power plant, by which we know that, in fact, these steam power plants still have very low overall efficiencies, about 10 to 15 percent. And a significant aspect of it, in fact, is in the power cycle itself. In fact, to the thermal to electrical conversion efficiency is only about 25 percent. And if we zoom into this picture, we know that, in fact, this relies on phase change, the evaporation and condensation of water. In this case, we know that, in fact, if we can, in fact, enhance the condensation processes, so decrease the temperature of the con condenser, you can, in fact, decrease the turbine back pressure, which can potentially increase your efficiency pretty significantly in the cycle. A correlated problem related to phase change, of course, is water consumption. When we think about the thermoelectric power plants in this case, we know that, in fact, the fresh water withdrawal to cool the condensers can be significant. And that's why you see these vapor plumes coming out of these power plants. And in fact, we know that steam power plants in the US count for about 40% of our nation's total fresh water withdrawal. So when we think about these thermal solutions, we have to think about how do we actually now take advantage of phase change but minimize the amount of water that we use in the system. So this is where our group, as well as many others, have been interested in being able to now manipulate phase change at multiple length scales. In particular, thinking about how we can use nano-engineered materials in a way to change the functionalities such that you can enhance phase change heat transfer. In particular, you can see here what have pe people have worked on many various aspects. One is that of using these kinds of structures, these nanopillar arrays, by which if you introduce the roughness and you make the surface hydrophobic, you can create something that's super hydrophobic, where the droplet of water on the surface exceeds that about 160 degrees or so. Now, there's been also a lot of work now to make more intricate structures. So not only can you repel liquids such as water, which is high surface tension, you can in fact now make them oleophobic. So you can repel low surface tension liquids like methanol or refrigerants that have surface tensions about 10 millinewtons per meter. And also on the opposite side, you can see that in fact, you can change the wettability such that you can make something super hydrophilic and in fact, locally pin the contact line such, you can, such that you can create interesting shapes as shown here and also different wetting behavior. And so they have been applied in taking advantage of various materials to also generate steam. For example, the solar absorber based system by which you can more now eff efficiently enhance steam generation. Thinking about desalination type devices with new carbon based materials as well as also changing the hydrophilicity and hydrophobicity selectively in nanopores, such that you can enhance the desalination process and separations. We've been particularly interested in the focus of my work today that I'm gonna talk about is in fact, in thinking about evaporation physics and how we can take advantage then of evaporation to enhance heat transfer and heat and mass transfer. And so you can see here, when we think about boiling in particular, you know that locally near the three phase contact line, the most efficient process for the heat transfer, in fact, is a thin film region itself, which is close to the bubble, the bottom of the bubble. And so to leverage that and to be able to now think about how we can take advantage of that thin film region, there has been work in trying to introduce these kinds of micro and nanostructures to enhance that thin film, extend the contact line. As you can see here with various nanotubes and pillar type arrays, there has been a, a significant interest to be able to do so, and but more fundamentally also create structures to be able to understand the limits of thin film evaporation. Of course, there are certain operating regimes for thin film evaporation that are of relevance for different applications. So here I plot here a regime map by which when we look at the fluxes, of the systems and the area of operation, you can see that 
And for evaporation into air, it's certainly very relevant for areas such as thermal desalination, building HVAC, solar vapor generation. However, when we start to think about electronics cooling, by which you have, say, a closed system, now evaporation into vapor becomes very important, and the fluxes are significant, and while the areas are small. So this maps out the needs in particular to help us understand how do we optimize devices when we're thinking about different application spaces, whether it's in evaporation to air or evaporation into vapor. And so when we look at the more molecular picture, in fact, we know that in air, such as steam generation or multi-effect distillation, we know we're in the diffusion-limited evaporation regime where the interfacial flux is now driven by the vapor concentration gradient between the interface and the far field. And the transport resistance associated with the gas diffusion, in fact, is much greater than the resistance associated with this thin area called the Knudsen layer, which is a few mean free pads thick. Now, if we look now, when we remove the air in the system, so for example, in a vapor chamber type thermal management device or a steam turbine where we have a closed system, these non-condensables are now removed. So there's no longer any air, as I mentioned, and it creates a pure vapor ambient. And this eliminates that diffusion resistance and enhances the performance. Now, in this case, the fundamental interfacial transport limit in this kind of system is dictated by the kinetics then across this highly non-equilibrium uh, gas region, which inevitably forms near the evaporating interface. And this has been of significant interest. However, it's very difficult to study. As you can imagine, it's only a few mean free paths thick. Um, and theoretically, of course, there has been quite a bit of work, in particular looking at trying to model now the gas expansion region with continuum gas dynamics and capturing this Knudsen layer with the Boltzmann transport equation. However, experimentally, this has been extremely difficult because you can imagine close to this interface, it's very difficult to measure this. In particular, when you try to probe, say, a thermocouple into the liquid, then now it can be invasive and affect actually the measurement itself. Also, also the structures have typically been relatively large on the order of about five millimeters. And so there's a large thermal conduction resistance that limits the heat fluxes that you can measure. And finally, with some various structures of these kind of nanoporous membrane films, that in fact, the thicknesses are still relatively large. So you can have very large pressure drops and can also lend itself to contamination, which also affects the measurement. And so these kinds of measurements, especially in this kinetically limited regime is non-trivial. And this is where we've been set, setting ourselves to try to understand more effectively and how do we probe this kinetically limited evaporation. And so briefly, I'll just mention the work of my former student now, Dr. Zongmao Lu, where he developed this idea in collaboration with Professor Ikua Kunifuchi, who helped us with some modeling, by which we can develop a platform to study evaporation from ultra thin nanoporous membrane. So the thickness of the membrane is about 200 nanometers. The pore is about 100 nanometers. So we can minimize the thermal resistance and minimize viscous losses as liquid is transported through this membrane to the evaporating interface. And we use metal layer here on top as the heater, as well as a thermocouple in some sense to measure the heat flux and the interfacial temperature. And because also that this membrane is thin, we can mitigate the risk of clogging uh, because of uh, the effects of diffusion that can help us, a balance really of infection and diffusion, it helps us now transfer contaminants away from the, the, the interface. So our goal here is using this kind of platform to help us now look at the flux as a function of the temperature rise to help us elucidate the kinetically limited evaporation regime. And so in fact, we fabricated this. It took multiple years to actually do so because of the fragility of this kind of device and pushing the limits of our fabrication tools. Where now you can see a top-down view where we have now this area that's suspended um, of this nanoporous membrane. If you zoom in further into this region, 
you can see now these pores that are on the order of about 100, na 100 nanometers uh, in diameter to help us now understand evaporation processes. And so we have a pretty simple device architecture then that we integrate into a test, test system by which now we flow water through the year at the top. And because of the capillary pressure at the interface, it draws a liquid passively into the device. And so it's self-regulating in nature. And we heat up now the membrane using a Joule heating. And we now me measure the temperature. And so our first experiment was evaporation in air. So here we show now the flux again as a function of the membrane temperature for the different samples, which are in the symbols. And what we show here is expected is that we actually have very good agreement by which we in fact use a metal Stefan equation, which is a more comprehensive equation where we capture diffusion, evaporation in air because fixed law in fact does not account for the convection and the large mass fractions. And we show that the maxwell stefan equation now agrees very well with experimental uh, data over a wide range of temperatures, which now suggests the reliability of this platform that we've used. Of course, what we're interested, as I mentioned, is what happens in a pure vapor environment. And that's what we've done is to create an environment and introduce this fixture, a test fixture, where we incorporate these test membranes into this controlled vapor chamber that we've created. And we can also get these experiments that are similar, where we look at the flux as a function now of the temperature difference, where the, the, the vapor ambient can be changed in terms of the temperature in the system. And so what you see here is as we expect, is a kinetically limited evaporation is more efficient than diffusion limited evaporation because we move the air and the resistance associated with that. And we also know that as you increase the system temperature, you expect to have interfacial heat transfer coefficient that is larger in this case. What we find though, is that what's very interesting is we start to non-dimensionalize collapsed all the data into a single um, point, uh, sorry, a single line. You see here is that now we have a normalized flux and this normalized flux is a normalized based on this important factor. This is what we call in fact, the figure of merit eventually, which accounts for the density of the saturated vapor, the, sonic, so, uh, the, uh, the vapor sonic speed, as well as the enthalpy difference between the two phases. And once he normalizes flux, as a plot, as a function of a pressure difference. In fact, it's a pressure ratio where um, we, we know that P naught, in fact, is the pressure of uh, the saturated vapor, that in fact, everything collapses onto this, in fact, line. And what's exciting about this is that first we've shown that kinetically limited evaporation is governed by the pressure ratio, not a temperature ratio. And in fact, this interfacial heat transfer coefficient now scales with this important figure of merit as shown here. Now, what does that mean, in fact, and as I'll get to in the next few slides, is that not only we've been able to elucidate kind of this regime by being able to probe it experimentally, what we now have is a nanoporous membrane that helps us um, understand how to actually now design our devices when we're operating in this kinetically limited regime. For example, we know that now in this heat pipe system, when we have this pure vapor ambient, that in fact, we know that this figure of merit in fact helps us choose the working fluid as well as working conditions by which we wanna maximize the interfacial heat transfer. Also, we can now start to think about now configurations by which we can increase evaporative fluxes using this kind of nanoporous configuration for steam generation and water desalination. And that's where I'll move forward and give you some examples based on the understanding that we've gained here. So if you take advantage of this evaporation figure of merit now, this understanding of it, and we can look at the important factors when we look at fluids, we see that in fact, that water is great in terms of liquid transport factor because of its high capillary um, ability, capillarity ability because of the high surface tension. 
However, when we start to look at this evaporation figure in merit, we start to see that in fact, that low surface tension liquids such as the refrigerant R245FA or that of pentane and methanol can be superior to that of water in this case. And so this helps us think about how we might take advantage of these fluids, which are particularly interesting for electronics because they serve as dielectrics, um, to be able to implement them in a configuration for high performance. And this is where we've been working on these hierarchical evaporators, where we know that we can now try to think about a device where we can take advantage of this kinetically limited evaporation and push the limits of heat transfer performance. So this evaporative structure that we have now is a hierarchical device, whereby you can see here that you in fact have this nanoporous membrane that's supported by microchannels. And what this does is we, with this hierarchy, we can have a high permeability and we can also have very high effective heat conduction to minimize resistance here to the membrane. And because of this multiple length scales that we have, characteristic length scales, we can minimize the pressure drops in the device. And in fact, you still evaporate off this interface. So it's a self-regulating type device. Now heat in this case, is being applied to the bottom of the surface, which is typical of electronics device. And we've also performed modeling. So now we have a device. So we take advantage of the model that we've done at uh, within kind of the interfacial uh, regime and couple it to now a device level model as a boundary condition. Uh, and we, I won't go into details here due to the limited time. However, what we've shown here with this kind of now device I'm showing now device level performance with the different fluids. So you can see here, this is the, the flux, the, the heat flux of the device that we measure as a function of the, the temperature difference between the base, the bottom, and the, the vapor. And here is a comparison of R2F45FA and pentane in the symbols. And this is our model in the lines. This looks at methanol and IPA, and this looks at water. You can see here we have the record high evaporation heat flux for dielectric fluids compared to that of water. And, and this is pretty interesting when you look at this, because in fact, um, because we've been able to now get and push to the limits of evaporation using the figure of merit and the, the kind of DL design, we can look at a regime map now based on what's been kind of reported before for dielectric liquids. This is a heat transfer coefficient as a function of your flux now. And we can start to get to higher fluxes and also higher heat transfer coefficients for these different working fluids. And when we look at now the pore level kind of heat flux as a function now of this temperature difference, you can see clearly that our device with these working fluids of dielectrics actually perform extremely well. And we now offer a different paradigm really for phase change heat transfer that enables favoring low surface tension liquids that are high volatility in, in, in nature. And this is pretty distinct from a lot of the work that's been done, but we think offers a promising direction to help us push the limits of evaporative physics and heat transfer because we can now start to access this kinetically limited regime. Now, um, for the last few moments of my time, I thought I'd share also another effort and thinking about now understanding evaporation both in the air and in vapor and how we can take advantage of that to develop real devices for desalination. And certainly there's been a lot of work in thinking about evaporation for all sorts of desalination type devices already. I give a few examples, I alluded to this earlier, um, in terms of using very interesting uh, materials such as carbon foam and exfoliated graphite on top as an absorber to now interface it with solar energy to generate steam efficiently. Also, there's been recent work in looking at how we can incorporate now these solar stills in salty ponds to help now desalinate water. Now, the challenge with these kinds of small scale devices is the low water production as well as a low flexibility in the choice of materials because of the coupling that they use between having very high absorptance materials for high solar energy gain. 
but also having good wickability and high thermal insulation. And so what we've designed in this case is new kind of idea by which we can now create now also a multi-stage desalination type device now. So instead of having a single stage type structure that evaporates and condenses, we can now have multiple stages by which we can recycle the vaporization enthalpy to drive evaporation into the next stage. The way it works is now we also decouple the function of the solar absorbers. And now we have a single solar absorber in our face with a hydrogel, sorry, a aerogel on the front side by which we can maximize the solar absorption. And we use that heat to now evaporate and use uh, actually pretty simple materials to help us now draw liquid into the structure by which you evaporate off of, and then condense and use that latent heat of condensation to then drive the next stage. And so by being able to now take advantage of evaporation design as well as condensation design, we can start to realize a proof of concept prototype that takes advantage of actually very low cost materials. In fact, in this case, now instead of the intricate structures that we've designed earlier for the thermal management device, now we have a very simple towel, it's a paper towel as an evaporator. And we have just a Teflon coat aluminum as a condenser. And, and in fact, now we just coat the, the front side with a paint. This is a solar absorber, selective solar absorber paint in a nylon frame. And now we can start to realize this low cost device by being able to understand and model evaporation and condensation as well as device design. And we could characterize this in interesting ways by which you can start to see that via this kind of multi-stage design, in fact, you can achieve a production rate of water of about 5.8 liters per meter squared per hour. And you can have a very high solar efficiency, solar thermal efficiency, because of the multi-stage nature of it. And in fact, when we start to look at this efficiency uh, for water and water production, you can see that efficiency can be exceeding close to about, uh, oh, exceeding what has been done before, reaching about 400% and very high production rates, close to about six liters per meter squared per hour, as I mentioned earlier. We can also even demonstrate this outside on our rooftop. And we've shown also equally good performance. And so this is, lends itself to new opportunities when we think about evaporative devices and how we can tailor materials for that. So I'll end here and say that there's st still certainly a lot of room for opportunities and how we can take advantage now of the physics of evaporation and how we then think about device design for a lot of different applications and how we scale these devices depending on the application to improve the performance that we need to realize energy and water challenges. Thank you very much for your attention. And of course, the work is really done with my tremendous group of students and postdocs, as well as my wonderful collaborators and funding. So happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Professor Wong, for this wonderful presentation as always. And uh, as expected, there's already, already questions. And I also had a question which incidentally matched with this first question that you can see in the panel. Uh, could you see this question in the Q&A or I can read it for you? Uh, uh, it's from Arnold Lahiri. Yes, I can see it now. Yeah. Um, mitigate non-condensable. Uh, I guess the, the focus is on non-condensable gases, is that right? Yes. And, um, and you see that of course with non-condensables, that will affect the performance. And, um, and certainly that is the case, right? And so what we've shown here, um, it's not about mitigating the non-condensables. I think you have to be in a regime by which you don't have the non-condensables because then you're gonna be diffusion limited at some point, right? So it's all about where the dominant resistance is in your system. What I show with this nanoporous membrane configuration is not that it can mitigate non-condensables, is that we can start to access a regime if there were not non-condensables and that we can start to push the performance. And because basically we start to, in this regime, the resistance that dominates in this case is the interfacial resistance, right? And so that's really the critical thing. And this 
doesn't resolve the practical challenges you have if you have, say, non-condensables that build up. And that has to do with this choice of kind of material selection and also the, the system, right, in terms of maybe making sure they extract the non-condensables before you uh, before you kind of build the system. So um, certainly those are important challenges because then if you do have a non-condensable, certainly expect that the resistances that are dominated by the non-condensables now will start to uh, be critical. And that's what you're seeing in which would inevitably also be the case if we were to have non-condensables in our system. Thank you. Devabrata from IIT Kanpur has a couple of questions which are related to this uh, solar thermal steel. And uh, uh, sorry, I'm not seeing that one. Uh, uh, which one? <laughs> uh, uh, okay, uh, the first one is how is the shape factor relevant for evaporation design for interfacial solar vapor generation device? for one to sun range, whether far field relative humidity has any relevance for the open system. Uh, I see, um, yeah, I'm sorry, I don't see it. Um, so you're asking about the shape factor um, yeah. for the evaporation. And this is related to, um, let me see if I can, um, the shape factor associated with, sorry, can you repeat that again? The, the, the part about the shape factor, yeah. yeah. I don't see it. Oh, the, yeah. you, you have to scroll up probably since there are a good number of questions. So if you oh, just, oh, I see. Uh, the later questions are coming. Mm, I see, I see. Um, um, so um, so uh, this is related to the shape factor for interfacial uh, solar vapor generation. And so here we are using, so here, um, what we're using here is, uh, I guess what's important here is that the sunlight now is now shining onto the, the surface by which you absorb the solar energy, right? And those, and how we now maximize that heat that's being transferred to the subsequent layers is very important. So we wanna make sure that of course, that um, you can effectively transfer the, first the heat from the sun to the absorber, and then more effectively transfer the heat. So the geometry, and how we define kind of the, I guess, how much, how we effectively transfer that heat from the condensation to the evaporator. But in this case, it's via conduction to via, uh, because they are interfaced through here. So of course the interfaces are very important in this case, and also how we now position the sun to the, the, the absorber itself. Um, and related to the humidity, um, uh, in this case, the humidity, so in this case, we're not extracting water through uh, the humidity in the air. This is through the case when we have water that's interfaced from the bottom. So this is like a salty water pond or something like that. And so I guess the ask is whether there's any effect of the humidity. We're not trying to grab the water from the, from the um, environment here in this case. Um, it's really for the evaporation of the water from from the, 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 the pond itself. And the next question he asked about, I think it's a comparison between the front side and the back side evaporation. Like, I mean, because the traditional solar steel that, that, that use the, uh, it's, it's heated from the back side and here you are using it just the reverse. So um, it helps in if uh, um, yeah, so certainly, um, yeah, we're heating from the backside. I mean, the fact that the towel is very thin, um, I think it shouldn't be an issue. So here, um, you know, really we're uh, we're really heating through a metal layer, which is also thin, and then two now evaporation. So in fact, this is still uh, in terms of uh, um, uh, we just have to account for that in the model, and this is certainly we're not really getting to the point of getting kinetically limited evaporation in this case, right? Because we certainly are in an air environment. So you're still diffusion limited. And that's what's really important in this case. And I had a question regarding this, like this silica aerogel, which is basically serving as a uh, high transmissivity, but very low thermal conductivity insulator. I mean, uh, what's the durability? Because first of all, like, I mean, we also tried uh, synthesizing that 
and and it's uh, prohibitively difficult to synthesize because they all all the time we are getting granules only and the, i mean in the in the long term stability like when you keep it in under the sun like for a long time uh, how how does it behave like i mean do you see any degradation over time for the aerogel uh, the top layers so we've seen a pretty high stability, I will say. Um, in this case, we often do interface it with like a, a, a cover so that mm -hmm. it, you don't get over time humidity um, in the in the aerogels. I will say that um, uh, they are pretty brittle. So you have to be pretty careful about handling them. But in terms of stability, we've actually noticed pretty good stability for this temperature range. And we've done higher temperature stability measurements. Um, and what we found is that sometimes you need to stabilize it with a coating so we can use atomic layer deposition to coat it for really high temperature applications. Um, but they are pretty stable, um, I will say. Um, I think certainly uh, there has been a lot of fine tuning to get them to kind of have the, the kind of the, um, uh, mechanical and kind of uh, thermal and uh, optical properties uh, that are desired. Um, and in fact, my, one of my students, Elise Strobach, along with Kyle Wilkie, my other student there, they have a company on this now. They have a startup that's working on trying to scale, which is one of the hardest challenges of this kind of aerogel, is to scale it up to large areas. Um, so, um, and there can be application for them for not only this kind of application, but for Windows is an important market as well. Uh, one more theoretical question from Teja, uh, uh, who's asking about how and where is the temperature measured in the experiment of kinetically limited evaporation experiment on nanopores? Yeah, so I, I sorry if I didn't explain it well, but uh, you can see here, um, sorry, I can't get out of this mode. Oh, here it is. Um, so here is our setup. And the idea here is our thermocouple is essentially a resistive, is a, heat, is a heater um, too. And it basically we can measure the temperature as a function of the change in resistance. We can essentially calibrate that it's known, it's known for a metal. And because it's very small pore, we believe that we can essentially say that this temperature that we measure here is a temperature at the interface. Um, because of the small structure. I see. And yeah, so that's how we measure it. Yeah, it's challenging. And uh, I'll take just uh, two more questions because of shortage of time. One by Navneet, who's asking like, uh, uh, in a hierarchical context, how do you, uh, how do the interfacial resistance upscale on macro level? What might be the reason for departure in the heat flux for experiments and simulations at higher delta T? Uh, I'm not sure about the second part of the question, but. Uh... Um, and so uh, I think in terms of the interfacial um, resistances upscale, um, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, I guess that um, you have to be in a regime by which this dominates, right? So yeah. um, if I understand the question correctly, um, so basically in this, um, so you can see here, um, in most cases, when you have air in the system, then you know that you're dominated by this diffusion resistance, right? And it's only when you're in a regime by which no other resistance dominates, can you now start to access this kinetically limited evaporation regime, by which the only resistance is important is this kinetic resistance. And a lot of the times the structure limits that because resistance of the structure actually is pretty large. And so then you can't also, it, that can also limit your ability to access this kinetically limited evaporation regime. Um, so there are this, so you have to kind of think about not only the environment that you are in, but also the, um, the how you design the structures to get to kind of um, get to the point whereby which your figure of merit is that evaporative figure of merit that I just mentioned earlier. Now, mm -hmm. the second question, uh, might, what might be the reason for departure and heat flux for experiments? Um, uh, I, think it's an, I think the departure from maybe typical, as you can see here in terms, I guess I'm gonna guess it's related to 
the different, uh, uh, I'm not sure, but I guess the question is related to the different fluids um, from departure, maybe that of water, um, if that or, or departure in a sense, oh, the, I, maybe the departure is related to this question. Maybe it's related, associated with this compared to the model. And I will say that in these experiments, and we say this in our paper, if you're interested, is that these devices, unfortunately, we didn't have as much of the foresight earlier about clogging. So over time, because of, even though we were using very pure water, there was still over time deposits on our membrane because we didn't effectively capture the kind of the effects of infection and diffusion. And we, and, and actually in our paper, in our supplemental, we talk about this in terms of how we can now mitigate this in the future. And just as a little bit of a, insight while I told the story this way. In fact, the, a lot of the physics that we explored in the prior work that I showed earlier, in fact, was done after this. And we learned a lot from those studies that then now helped us understand this data better. And so in that case, I think we already had the devices and we were able to optimize further this effect of this clogging. And that's what you see here. And that's why you see the departure. Yeah, we, we indeed are running out of time, but I just couldn't prevent from asking this last question, which one of which Girish has asked and everybody asks on every forum. How can you please give some insight on lifetime estimation methods of nano engineered surfaces? These surfaces are thrown out under the sun and uh, in a power plant and they are always exposed to rough weathers. How do you estimate the life? It's a really important question. And this is something that we, I think, have to be explored. And actually people are exploring this in terms of durability, robustness. These are questions that the field in particular has been interested in because of the practicality needs, especially in steam power plants for it's like 30 years. Um, and I will say that it's very difficult, I think, to project on these surfaces. There's um, there's been quite a bit of work, especially in condensation, because of the need for um, robust kind of hydrophobic surfaces, and often the hydrophobic nature of it is uh, makes it uh, challenging to preserve in harsh conditions. But there is a lot of work being done in this area beyond my group, others um, in the field as well. Um, so I think lifetimes is something I think there can certainly be some accelerated testing done and extrapolation with models. That is often one path that, and I think often industries also by being able to work with industries, they're the ones that can help kind of do some of this kind of harsher testing and extrapolate there. I think that's probably our best um, uh, ability at this time, but I think this is an active area of interest because now that we do have these kind of um, great surfaces, we want to be able to now be able to really incorporate them in, in that impactful applications. Well, thank you very much, Professor Wang, for this wonderful, wonderful lecture. I really regret that we couldn't have more time. Praveen is like staring at me, it seems, like since we are already <laughs> consumed more than 10 minutes. Uh, our sincere thanks uh, for illuminating us on this highly exciting topic. And we are honored to have you. In today's thank keynote. you very much. I appreciate it. And thanks for all the questions. It's really wonderful to hear the enthusiasm. And I hope many of you also continue to work on this field because there's still a lot to be done. So thank you. Thank you very much. So Pravin, so we could log out now. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I had thank you. the organizing team. Thanks, Professor Evelyn Wong for her insightful keynote talk and Professor Ranjan Ranguli for sharing this session. Plenary lecture by Rajat Mittal, Professor Rajat Mittal from Johns Hopkins is going on. Please join using plenary session link. Thank you.